Unit 9, the Great Depression, the New Deal, and World War II. So uh, one thing I do want to remind people of today uh, is that if you are ever absent, uh, I do my best to post all the lectures online. So if you go on Facebook at all, it's this thing where people like connect and like share photos. You may have heard of it. Uh, I have the, again, I have Mr. King's U.S. History page on Facebook. If you can't find it, find one of your friends in the class. I'm sure they've liked it already. Um, I do post the lectures online. Uh, I try to do my best to post it once uh, the fr Wednesday class is over and then by the time the Friday class is over. Sometimes I'll record Tuesday, Thursday, so you should have it by Tuesday, Thursday, even if you have a Friday class. Um, I try to have those lectures posted so that even if you are absent, the lecture should be made available to you. So please use that as a resource. Um, if you're listening to this online, then obviously you already know that this is online. So this is just for the people that are listening to it online if they're absent. Uh, otherwise, uh, again, if you are absent any given day, just know that I am getting to the habit of recording all of my lectures so that if you miss something, you can just pull it off online, which means you don't have an excuse to say, oh, I wasn't there. Or I, I didn't see the lecture where we talked about that essay. Um, I'm going to hold you guys responsible for that. Okay, If you guys are absent, you can't say, I didn't know, because you now have this resource available online. The lectures are all online. So if you're absent, it's your responsibility to check it out. Is that clear with everyone? Now, if you can't find it, please let me know, and then I will give you the link. Um, you can also um, do the RSS feed on my YouTube page, and then that way, every time I upload another lecture, it just automatically goes to you. So in addition to like all your Beyonce and Justin Bieber and One Direction stuff, they'll be like Mr. King, and so it'll be kind of cool. Today's uh, topic today, folks, is the Great Depression and how we got there. That'll pretty much encapsulate today's lecture. Uh, and then Friday and uh, Wednesday's lecture next week will encapsulate the rest of the New Deal and how we try to get out of it. Uh, and then we'll start talking about World War II, at which point you'll likely have another take-home test, but an in-class essay. Does that make sense for everyone? So that's kind of we're going to wrap that all together. Um, likely your next essay will be a DBQ, so I want to make sure I get you guys your uh, essays back uh, before that. So let's talk about the election of 1928. Uh, in the election of 1928, uh, Republican Herbert Hoover ran against Democrat Alfred E. Smith. Here they are in campaign button form, a very popular form of campaigning at this time. Uh, still a little bit today, but today it's more like bumper stickers. Today it's a little bit more like flags and you know, emails and whatever else, Facebook posts. Uh, but back then, campaign buttons were kind of the way to go. Everyone had a campaign button representing who they supported. And in this election between Republican Herbert Hoover and Democrat Alfred E. Smith, uh, this is the first time you start seeing the use of radio campaigns. Radio campaigns. So people get on the radio and be like, when are you going to vote for the president in 1928? Don't forget to vote for Herbert Hoover, <laughs> the man with the plan. Now back to Al Jolston and the jazz singer which is on radio, so this would not make any sense whatsoever. Unless it was just the music of Al Jolston from the jazz singer. Because radios don't show picture, so, so you know. This election was also interesting or unique because this is an election uh, in which Herbert Hoover accused Alfred E. Smith of being dangerous. Herbert Hoover accused Alfred E. Smith of being a dangerous candidate for president because Alfred E. Smith was Catholic. Herbert Hoover, or Hoover accused Smith of being dangerous because he was a Catholic. Now, what might the fear be that Smith was a Catholic. Why might he be dangerous as president if he is a Catholic? Any question or any ideas about why that might be the case, that a Catholic would be a dangerous person to be president? Any guesses? Marisol? He might like discriminating against other religions. Discrimination against other religions, maybe, but that's not really what it is. So it's not a fear of discrimination, but that's a good guess. 
Any other guesses as to why this Catholic might be dangerous to be president of the United States? Any other guesses? I'm, a, I'm a willing to take guesses. Any other guesses out there? Folks, as a Catholic, uh, what are some of the basic uh, worshiping practices of Catholics that are not common for Protestants? Like, what do Catholics do that Protestants don't necessarily like? Let me put it another way. Recently in the news today, something big was happening with the Catholic Church. What was it? Okay, the Pope. Why might there be a concern that a U.S. president is Catholic? As a Catholic, what are you expected to do? Any Catholic. What is, ex what is expected of any Catholic? Who are they supposed to listen to? The church, and in this case, the Pope. A man. A man on earth. So is there a concern that a Catholic president might be influenced by a man in Italy? Is that a concern for the American people? That this president might be influenced by the Pope, a man who lives in Europe? That is the concern, folks. They feared that the Pope would have influence over the president, which is a pretty good assumption. I mean, there is a fear that the Pope would have influence over the president. Because they say it's great being a Christian, you know? Because if you're influenced by God, no big deal. Everyone's influenced by God, but the Catholics have a man on earth. And are men corruptible? Are men greedy? So the fear was, what if this pope is a bad pope and this president puts religion over government? And so there was a fear that a Catholic would be a dangerous president. Since then, have we ever, have, have we ever had a Catholic president? Alfred E. Smith does not win. But have we ever had a Catholic president? Who? John F. Kennedy. The same thing happens when Kennedy runs for president. He's like, he's a Catholic. It'll be dangerous. And how he kind of fixes people's fears is he says, I will put government over religion. And people are like, OK, if that's good enough for us. That makes a lot of sense that you would do that because you're president. But back then, Alfred E. Smith said that, but people didn't really believe him. So uh, he is argued to be dangerous because, uh, you know, He's a Catholic. In any case, here are the results. Hoover wins by a landslide, winning 444 to 87. In fact, if you look at the popular vote, 58% to 41%. That's a huge win, 58% to 41%. That's a huge win. That's an overwhelming win. That is a mandate of the people win. So when you have 58%, to 40%, uh, yeah, you won that election hands down. So 58 to 41%, 444 to 87 electoral. I don't understand the percentages though. If you look at the percentages on the electoral, it says 33.5% to 16.5%. I'm not a mathematician, but my understanding is that doesn't equal 100%. Hey, look, 33.5% and then 16.5%. That doesn't equal 100. So whoever made this graph, and it wasn't me, did not do their math right in that one instance. Because I don't know where the other, what, 51% went? I don't know. Don't ask me. So Herbert Hoover becomes the 31st president of the United States, serving from 1928 to 1932, which means what do we already know about Herbert Hoover? He only serves one term. Uh, what do you think might have hurt his chances of winning a second term? I would argue the Great Depression. I would say that uh, if you're president and there's a time period called the Great Depression that begins during your administration, I don't think you're going to win the next election. I mean, call me crazy, 
But I don't think the Great Depression was a period of time in which people were really happy and excited and times were great. I don't think it was, you know, people were so happy that they left a depression in history of all their joy and excitement. I would argue, as a historian, that the Great Depression uh, was a period of sorrow and sadness and not good times. Uh, but we'll let history prove me right or wrong in just a moment. He is a Republican. He uh, ran the U.S. Food Administration during World War I, as you already know. And he was Secretary of Commerce, or Secretary of Business, uh, same thing, under President Harding and Coolidge. With that in mind, what do we know uh, then about his policies toward business? Is he pro or anti-business? If he served under Harding and Coolidge, is he pro or anti-business? He's pro-business, definitely pro-business. And so, folks, during his campaign, he campaigned on these two quotes. A chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. So what does that suggest? What does he expect to happen during his administration? What's going to happen during his administration? Yeah, Julie. Yeah, I mean, he runs on a platform of prosperity, is what we call it. He ran on a platform of prosperity. A chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Will people go hungry during his administration? Will people be able to buy things during his administration? Will the economy rise during his administration? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. At least he thinks so. And he also says, during my administration, poverty will be banished from the nation. And people think, wow, this guy, Hoover, I mean, he's just going to vacuum up all the poverty and just toss it in the, you know, the bin. That's amazing. I like this guy. And it turned out well, right? I mean, he was right, right? No, complete opposite. Not exactly what he was promoting. I guess he did not realize that there was a depression coming. He did not have that on his calendar. But again, can you imagine the guy being like, guys, don't worry. When I become president, things will be the best ever. And then when you're president, it's the complete opposite of what you campaigned on. So anyway, the great crash of 1929. How did it happen? What happened during the great crash of 1929? I should probably make clear, the great crash of 1929 is the immediate cause or the short-term cause of the Great Depression. This is the short-term cause or immediate cause of the Great Depression. Will there be long-term causes? Of course, as always, there will be long-term causes. But the short-term cause of the Great Depression will be the Great Crash of 1929. <laughs> Everyone ready? Here we go. The first thing that you guys should note, one of the major reasons why the stock market crashes in 1929 is that at this time, the stock market was a bull market. So a bull market is when the stock market is rapidly increasing. A bull market is when the stock market is rapidly increasing. You should know the definition. A bull market is when the stock market is rapidly increasing. Does anyone know what a slow market is or a slowly increasing market is? It's a bear market. A bear market is a slow market. But in any case, it's a bull market. It's charging. It's roaring very, very, very quickly during this time period. So here's what it looks like. Assume that I'm an investor and I buy stocks on day A or day one. And when I buy my stocks there, my stock, let's say an Apple costs, I don't know, ten dollars it's a pretty low stock but then all of a sudden after let's say about three months the stock goes up to i don't know here's point b let's say one hundred dollars did i make a lot of money sure i did let's say i bought a hundred shares did i make a lot of money of course i did and so you guys see oh my gosh mr king did you increase your stock by tenfold you made that much money well what should you do what are you going to do, guys? Are you going to buy it $100? Of course you are. You can't buy it. Can you buy it at 10? You can't buy it at 10. You can only buy it at 100 because that's how much it costs now. So you're going to buy stock at $100 because you believe what is going to happen to the stock. 
it's going to increase in value. So you wait three months, you buy your stock, and uh, by day C, your stock is now to $200. Did it increase as much as mine? No, but did it still increase? Like, oh my gosh, my stock doubled. That's amazing. I made so much money. So this entire half of the class is getting rich now. And you guys are like, oh my gosh, you guys bought 200 and it, it, 100 and it doubled to 200. So what do you guys want to do now? Are you going to buy it at $200? Of course you are. Because did it increase the first time? Did it increase the second time? What's going to happen the third time? Increase again. At least you assume it's going to. So obviously, folks, what are we talking about already? This is clearly over speculation. This is obviously already over speculation. When you have a bull market, does it naturally lead itself to people hoping to get rich quick? Does it naturally lead itself to over speculation? Of course it does. Even I would do this. Guys, in 2008, before the market crashed, I saw this happening and I bought stock in a market. You guys said, holy crap, this is increasing, increasing, increasing. I know it's not going to last forever, but if I buy soon and sell quickly, I should make a good amount of money, which I did. But you need to know the trends, and a bull market was occurring as it was back then. Here's the problem. I bought it at $10, and let's say I eventually sold it at $200. Did I make a lot of money? Sure. You guys bought at $100, and you sold for $200. Did you guys make a lot of money? So the expectation is you guys are gonna buy at 200 with the assumption that you're gonna sell it for, let's say, three or 400, right? Okay, so here we go. Here's why this is all good. You buy, let's say, a stock for $200. And in order to make some real money, you wanna buy 1,000 shares. Because, and how much is that gonna cost in total in order for you to buy all of that? You're gonna need how much money? $200,000. Is that clear with everyone so far? Now, does anyone here have $200,000 in their bank account right now? Anyone? Trust funds or anything like that? No? I don't. So let's say, you know what, comfortably, if I save, I can put down $50,000. Comfortably. But, and that's if I buy the stock at $200. But do I have a full $200,000? So how do I get the extra $150,000? Where do I get it from? The bank. I'm going to borrow from a broker an extra $150,000. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Well, the stock increases to $400. And so, how much money did I make? Or how much money is this stock now worth, my 1,000 shares? It's now worth $400,000. How much did I borrow from the bank? 150, which means I have to pay that back, which means how much do I have left? 250,000. Plus, if you don't count the original 50,000 that I made, how much profit did I make by borrowing money? $200,000. Did I lose any money? No. And was there a risk if this was a bull market. Did I have a risk of losing it in my assessment? In my assessment, oh my gosh, look how much money I'm making. There's no way I can lose. So am I willing to borrow $150,000? Of course I am. Because what do I believe is going to happen to the market? It's going to keep increasing. And was it a good investment for me? Oh my gosh, I made $200,000 off a $50,000 personal investment. That's a pretty good return. I quintupled my money. And I borrowed most of it, so I can't complain. And so this is what people were thinking at the time. I should borrow money and buy stocks because am I going to make a lot of money? Yeah. Well, when you buy that stock or borrow money for that stock, folks, that's called buying on margin. So here's what happened. In order for people to take advantage of this stock market, people also began buying on margin, or the people began buying on credit, is another term. And again, using the example on the slide here, let's say you wanted to buy 1,000 shares at $10 each, but you only have $5,000. You have to borrow the other 5,000. Is that clear with everyone so far? Sure. So, this is your initial investment at $10. 
If the stock goes up to $15, are you going to make money? Yes, you are going to make $5,000. And here's the best part. Did you lose any money? No. And you can pay back the $5,000 that you borrowed. You get to keep your original investment, and this extra $5,000 is all profit. Plus, right? Bonus for everyone. You win, the bank wins, everybody wins. But the problem is, is the stock market always going to increase? No. Sometimes the stock market decreases. And let's say a minimal $3, uh, $3 drop, the stock market is now uh, down to $7. So you put in $10,000. Who do you have to pay back first, yourself or the stockbroker? Stockbroker. So you have to pay back that $5,000 first, which means you're left with whatever's left over. How much money did you lose? You lost $2,900. So is that good for you? No. Because do you get to take your money out first? No, you have to, take out, you have to give the stockbroker his money first, and then you take what's left. So is that a risk for you if it goes down? Sure. This is always a risk. But here's what happened during the Great Depression. Not only did the stock drop, but instead of dropping to $7, the stock dropped to about $2, which means the stock was here at that level. Could you pay back the stockbroker in full with the money that the stock was worth? No. So let's say you still owe the stockbroker $3,000. You still owe him money. So what are, you, what are you required to do to pay him back? You gotta sell your car. What if that's not enough? You gotta sell your property. What if that's not enough? You gotta sell your house. And is it possible that after you, after you sell all of that, you still don't have enough to pay back the stockbroker? Sure, but you've sold everything. And so does the stockbroker and the bank lose money? The bank trusted you and said, you're gonna pay me back my 5,000, right? They said, yeah, sure. But what if you can't? What if you're still short like $500? Can the bank take anything else from you? No, so too bad bank. And guess what? The bank took everything from you already. So what do you have? Nothing. Now multiply that by about 6,000 banks losing about 500 to $1,000 per person. Multiply that by almost 25 million people across, 25 million people across the country losing everything. And then you can see why the Great Depression starts to begin. Folks, the great stock market crash began on October 29th, 1929. You guys saw what was happening to the stock, right? It keeps on going up and up and up and up. And do you guys understand why stock prices go up? Do you guys understand why that is? Let me explain. The great crash of 1929, uh, October 1929, October 29, 1929, uh, is known as Black Tuesday. It's known as Black Tuesday. Tuesday. And on this day, everyone realized that the stock that they were buying was not worth its value. Everyone realized that their stocks were not worth their value. And so everyone began to sell and no one was buying. Everyone began to sell their stocks and no one was buying. Again, everyone began to sell and no one was buying. Let me explain how stocks work. In place of stocks, folks, we're going to use a hamburger. Okay? Assuming that it's pretty much the same principle. It's lunchtime, or it's, let's say, third period, fourth period today. I have a hamburger. People are kind of hungry, but I bought it for a dollar at McDonald's. So, again, this hamburger is now currently worth a dollar. But people's stomachs start grumbling and people start getting really hungry. People are thinking, oh, I'm gonna, a dollar, I'm gonna buy that from Mr. King. So I say, well, how much are you willing to buy this hamburger for? So one person says, well, I'll buy it for a dollar, Zaneri says. Well, I'll buy it for two dollars, Cordell says. I'll buy it for four dollars, Rihanna says. I'll buy it for six dollars, Leslie says. And we start increasing that value. Now, is that burger, how much did I pay for it? One dollar. But is the value going up as demand for it increases? 
And that's just a magical value, guys. That's just a magical number that people are willing to pay. Well, that hamburger, if people start hearing grumbling, oh my God, I'm so hungry. Someone secretly tells you know, the friend, I'm willing to pay $20 for that burger. I am so hungry right now. Someone's like, I'll pay $30 for that burger. But do they want to pay $30 right away? If they can pay less, would they pay less? Of course. But there are rumblings and grumblings that some people are willing to pay up to $30. Now, they would rather pay less, but they're willing to pay up to $30. So let's say Brittany whispers to Vanessa, I would pay $30 for that burger. Okay? And Vanessa, having a big mouth, tells everyone else quietly. And so now a bidding war begins because even if, uh, let's say, Ramon buys it for $10, is he still going to make a profit? Remember, this burger would cost a dollar before. If he buys it for $10, is he still going to make money? Because can he still sell it to Brittany for 30 Sure. Then Cynthia buys it for 15 I'll buy it for, for 15 because I can still make a profit. Says, I'll buy it for 25 because I can still make a profit. Does that make sense with everyone so far? There's an expectation. You can still make money selling that stock because other people want to buy it at that price. So Cynthia buys it for $25. And then the bell rings. And it's lunchtime. And all of a sudden, are there lots of hamburgers available at $1? Sure. So, Cecia, you don't have a hamburger worth $25. Do you want your money back? Of course you do. But is Brittany willing to buy that hamburger for $25? Is she willing to buy it for $30? Why would she when there's hamburgers available? So he says, Brittany, that's healthy for $20. You say, nope. Anyone? $19? $15? $10? $12? Four? Two? One? Why would I buy it for one when that hamburger is used? It's been passed around by 10 people when I can get a fresh hamburger outside. Uh, 25 cents? I'll buy it for 25 cents. And so, what happened to the value of that burger? It just disappeared. You paid $25 to me for something. Are you going to get it back? No. The value literally, folks, just disappeared. It's gone. And so that's what happened. People began to realize that the stock that they were buying was not worth what they paid for. So they began to sell it like crazy. Like, oh my God, this railroad is not worth $80. What was I thinking? Sell, sell, sell. But the problem is as they're selling the stock, is anyone buying it? Which means there's no demand. So eventually the stock goes from 80 and the first people can sell it for 80. And then as people start running and saying, sell my stock too, the stock is now down to 60 because no one wants to buy it. And eventually, by mid-November, after two weeks, the stock market has lost $25 billion. $25 billion has just disappeared from the stock market after two weeks. Guys, within hours, let me put it this way, within hours, the stock market crashed. And two weeks later, the stock market had lost $25 billion because people were just selling, 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 selling. Within hours, the stock market crashed, and after two weeks, the stock market lost $25 billion. Remember that photo that we took about how people were really excited after World War I ended? Here's that same photo of people panicking outside Federal Hall as they raced down to Wall Street trying to get their money out of the stock market. Marisol. Stocks were for railroads, businesses, automobiles, Ford, food businesses, oil, stocks for anything. Stock is just money that you lend to a company. So for example, Apple, right? Apple says, buy our stock for $400. It's kind of like a loan to the company. You own part of the company. And you're kind of saying, I'm going to give you $400 because I believe that you can take my money and invest it into something smart and make more money out of it. So you give $400 to Apple. The expectation is Apple going to use your money smartly. And if Apple does, will Apple make more money selling, let's say, the iPhone 6? And if they sell a lot of iPhone 6s, then it's likely that now, instead of Apple being worth $50 billion when you paid $40, $400 for it, Apple is now worth, let's say, $80 billion. So now Apple can divide that amongst the millions of shares that it has, and each stock is not worth $400 anymore. Each stock is now worth $425. Does that make sense? That's how stocks work. It's kind of like a loan, like a Liberty loan or a war bond, but you're giving it to a company as a stock. It wasn't one in particular. It was every stock. It was steel, any trust, oil, food, whatever. Any business that is 
publicly shared is a stock, and there were hundreds of companies that had stocks at the time. In any case, people are buying stocks like crazy, and here they are panicking, trying to get their stocks out of the market. Here they are panicking, trying to get, as the, trying to get their money out of the market as quickly as they can. The problem is there's not going to be any money left. Remember those banks that loaned that money out to all those people? Well, all of a sudden, when I loaned you $5,000, the stock dropped to like a dollar, which means you don't have any money to pay me, pay me back. Even if, you, let's say you bought a stock at $10, so you bought a $10,000 worth, and then all of a sudden that stock is now worth $1. You can only pay me back $1,000. That's it. So as a bank, I lost money. As an investor, you lost money. As a business, Apple, all these businesses that you guys invested in, they also lost money. Because when you're selling your stock, who are you telling to give you back your money? Not just the bank, the business. When you buy stock, folks, you're buying part of a business. When you sell your stock back to the business, they have to give you back your money. So they have to start giving the money back to the people. So the businesses will lose money. When those businesses lost value, the people lost money. When those people couldn't pay back the banks, the banks lost money. And so everyone is losing in this panic stock market sell-off. Here are people running across the streets, freaking the hell out as the economy starts to go down the drain. People literally had to sell anything that they could. This is likely a $1,200 car, folks. He's selling it for $100 uh, because you have to have cash because he lost everything on the stock market. I mean, everything. And he's willing to sell his car for 100 because he needs something. And the problem is, does anyone have any money to buy? Most people don't have any money to buy either because everyone lost money in the stock market. People waiting in the banks. Here's this cartoon. Excuse me, buddy. Is this a bread line or a run on the bank? Because pretty much it's exactly the same thing. People waiting in line to get their money out of the bank are going to be the same people waiting in line to get bread because they have nothing left. The bank doesn't have any money and you don't have any money. So you're going to be waiting in the exact same lines for bread as you would for money. That's never going to come. Here's the chart, folks. If you look, the Roaring Twenties did really, really well. And then look how far it dropped during Black Tuesday. I mean, that's a steep drop. And then it got a little bit better for a time. And then look how far it went. Guys, the market bottomed out. It literally hit rock bottom. The market just fell as far as we thought it could, and it, it just literally just bottomed out. That's as low as the market could go. So after about three years of the Great Depression, the market just uh, kind of bottomed out. By the way, just so you know, this Great Depression time period will last until about 1944. So imagine how long that is. It's 15 years of people gonna have to deal with this. Stock prices drop dramatically. Again, folks, imagine your stock originally being worth $24. Nowadays, it's worth only $7. That's a huge drop in stock. But average stock prices dropped during this time period, dramatically dropping in a very short period of time. So average stock prices dropped during this time period. Furthermore, the gross national product also fell. Gross national product is also known as GNP. Does anyone know what GNP is? What GNP stands for? What gross national product means? You know what that means, that term? It's a term you definitely have to know for next year in economics. Gross national product, by the way, does anyone know what gross means? What does gross mean in economic terms? Huh? It means total amount. It means total. So gross national product means total. Um, it's a total amount of a pretty much gross national product is what your country produces. It's the total that your country produces. That's the gross national product. The total of what your country produces. And what do you notice after 1929? What happens to the GNP? After 1929? It drops, which means the entire country just stops producing quite a bit. In fact, folks, look, it drops almost 50% the amount that is dropping, or 40% rather, of what it's producing. That's a huge drop in terms of production. Let's talk about the effects of the Great Depression. So what happens here? So stock market crashes, so what? What is going to be the impact of a Great Depression? 
because you know people losing money in you know, businesses is one thing but what about the rest of society and by the way folks if you're over speculating are you taking a risk yeah. is it possible that you'll lose yeah. of course and so should these people have known that there was a risk in losing their money yeah. of course there was there was always a risk did they think it would apply to them no they always assume that don't worry we'll be the lucky ones I know what's happened 20 years ago, back in 1907, but uh, what's the chance that it'll happen again every 20 years? I mean, it's not like history tells us that these things happen cyclically about every 20 years. Oh wait, it does tell us that. It's exactly what history tells us, is that things happen cyclically about every 20 years. The first effect, bank failures. Folks, bank failures. The conservative estimate is that 5,197 banks collapsed. A more liberal or loose estimate says that about 6,300 banks collapsed. It depends on who you talk to. But 5,197 banks collapsed nationwide. Here's a problem, folks. If you put your money in a bank, Do you expect your money to still be there? Of course, it's your money. So let's say there are about 30 of us in this room and we each put $1,000 in the bank, let's say four years ago. Today, is there gonna be $30,000 in the bank? Are there gonna be $30,000 in the bank today? If we all put $1,000 in the bank, if there's 30 of us, that's $30,000, and we put it in the bank 10 years ago or four years ago, if we all go to the bank today, should there still be $30,000 in the bank? No, where's the money? They loaned it out to other people. Maybe they loaned it out to local businesses. Maybe they loaned it out to stock investors, right? And so the problem is, is it possible that the bank lost some of that money? Did a lot of the banks lose their money in that stock market? Of course, because we lent it out to this first row here and you guys decided to over speculate and you lost all of our money. In fact, no, you didn't lose all of it. Let me apologize. You lost $20,000 uh, $20, $20, of our $30,000, which means how many people can get their $1,000 back? 10 people. Let's say this entire row can get their money back. What about the rest of you in the two, second and third row? Can you guys get any money back? Nope, you get $0 back. Sorry though, there's no way you're gonna get that money back. Sucks for you. You don't get your money back too bad. And is that your fault? That your money was lost? Not at all. It was their fault. The entire time, it was a stock investor's fault. Maybe it was the bank's fault for lending it out, but ultimately, that's what happens in banks. And so sorry guys, you lost your money because the bank lent your money out and there was nothing you can do about it. You're an innocent victim. As a result, folks, 500,000 farms and homes foreclosed. Here's why. First off, some people could no longer pay their bills because they lost all their money in the stock market. Others, the bank said, we have no money left. And so let's say this first row of people, we loaned them money in the stock market to buy stocks. Is their money gone already? Sure. So the bank lost all of its money. But does the bank have other loans? Home loans, farm loans. So the bank says, we need our money back now. So I loaned you guys money, the second row right here, I loaned you guys money to buy houses over 30 years. And you had 30 years to pay it back. But do I need my money back right now? So I say, sorry guys, I need my money back today. Do you have my money? No? Okay, well then give me your houses. Sorry, I need my money back today. You guys are homeless. Too bad. And it was not your fault. It was their fault. So this is what's happening. It's a snowball effect. You guys start losing your homes. You guys start being foreclosed upon. And the stock value of the entire economy, folks, drops from $87 billion to $19 billion you have almost a 70% decrease or $70 billion decrease in value. It's pretty bad what's happening in the US economy during the Great Depression. From 87 to 19. If you look folks, this many banks close by 1930. And in 1932, a lot more banks closed. And then by 1933, late 1933, no more banks are closing. Why? 
Yeah, there were no more banks to fail. They all failed already. Only the strongest banks remained by the late 1933. Only a few banks were left, and those were like the really, really strong banks. But all the other ones were gone. They all collapsed. And so the crazy part is that we got so deep into this depression that all the banks that were going to fail, failed. Like we failed every single bank that was weak by 1933. And by 1934, the only banks that remained were the strong ones. Like who? Like JP Morgan Chase, right? That was one of the only banks that remained left because it was a strong bank. But all the other banks, gone, just gone because they were too weak. Here's a man talking to a squirrel. But why didn't you save some money for the future when times were good? And the man replies, I did. I put it in the bank. And so folks, did this man over speculate in the stock market? Did this man do anything wrong? Not at all. And yet, was he a victim of bank failure? He did nothing wrong, and yet, and he did exactly what he was supposed to, right? You guys are all told, don't forget, save your money, put it in the bank. He was encouraged by the government, encouraged by society. Do your part, encourage investment, put your money in the bank. So he did. And what did the bank do? Lost all of his money. And so he had no part in this over speculation, but he lost all of his money in the bank. He didn't do anything wrong, but the bank lost his money. And is he ever going to get it back? No. Now again, imagine this for about 40% of the population. And that's a serious issue. In terms of business failures, you have thousands of businesses failing across the country, guys. Thousands upon thousands of businesses failing across the country. Steel production drops by 80%. Why are we dropping steel so dramatically? Why does steel production stop? They're not buying cars, they're not building buildings, they're not building skyscrapers, they're not building trains or railroads. Pretty much, are people going to keep buying new products? No. So if they stop steel production by 80%, what does that mean for 80% of the steel production workforce? They're all going to be unemployed. They're all going to be laid off because there's no buyers left. Industrial output for the entire country, folks, 50% of the U.S. economy just stops producing. Imagine if that happened today, if 50% of the economy just stopped producing. That's what happens, folks. The Great Depression really took a toll on the U.S. economy. What do you think they're producing left? What's the last 50% still being produced? Necessities, maybe food, clothes, canned goods, but that's about it. Are we producing cars and radios and, you know, headphones and all that stuff? No, not at all. Look at business failures, folks. We're talking about the hundreds of thousands. At its peak, you had about 150 plus thousand businesses shut down. 150,000 businesses shut down. That's quite a bit, 150,000 businesses. You wanna talk about unemployment, guys? Nationwide, the conservative estimate is that 25% of the population was unemployed. 25%, one in four. That is a lot of people that don't have work. 25% of the nation was unemployed. The more liberal estimate, if you include farmers, guys, is 40%. 40% of the country was unemployed, which means that's almost one in every two people that have no work. Imagine if almost half the country had no work. And in fact, you can imagine that if you went to Chicago, 50% of Chicago was unemployed, guys. 50% of Chicago had no work at all. Farmers, 33% of all farms failed. These are staggering numbers. At our worst in the 2008 recession, guys, we were at 13% unemployment. And that was already pretty bad, right? For us, we're still struggling. California right now is at a 9% unemployment rate, and that's still pretty bad for us. 40% nationally was the unemployment rate. That's more than three times what we currently have. That's a crazy amount. And you see how much we're already struggling as an economy. Imagine a 40% unemployment rate across the country. 
and that's where the economy hit rock bottom. If you look, folks, again, a staggering increase of the workforce is unemployed by 1929. A lot of people argue that the reason why the economy was not so good was that did wages change over the course of the 1920s? Not really, right? They stayed about the same. And so the argument was we should have paid workers more. Because if families get paid more, what can families do with that money? They can buy stuff. Not necessarily save, they can buy. And if people buy, what does that do? Yeah, it helps stock market, it creates jobs. If people buy 10,000 new toasters next year, is that gonna create jobs? Because we need to make, hire more people to make toasters. And so that's what the argument, one of the arguments is, is that one of the biggest problems we did not do was spread out that wealth. We didn't increase wages for regular families, so regular families did not have enough money to buy. If you look at unemployment figures, folks, unemployment skyrockets during this time period. Here are people having to sell their homes, look for jobs, sell their farms. And so many of these people that were unemployed became homeless. And many of them were forced to live in what became known as Hoovervilles. Hoovervilles. A Hooverville also known as shanty towns, <clears throat> Hoovervilles, also known as shanty towns, were communities of homeless people. They were communities of the homeless. And in these shanty towns, what did they live in? Sometimes cars, if they still had a car. Other people made their homes out of blankets and sticks and trees. Some people just lived in tents. But imagine entire communities and cities broken down to being forced to live in Hoovervilles. Uh, pretty much, folks, these people lived in makeshift homes. Makeshift homes. Uh, you guys go to developing countries today, you guys see these homes still, right? They're made out of cardboard or made out of scrap metal or tin. That's pretty much what these homes were made out of. And why did we call them Hoovervilles? Why did we call these homes Hooverville, or communities Hoovervilles? Why? So is this term used to kind of honor the president? No, it's a sarcastic, you know, stab at the president. Hey, Mr. President, now you said that uh, things are gonna get better. You were right, now everyone has a home. Thanks for my new house, President Hoover. But this is where some people were living, literally made out of sticks, blankets, and a tree branch. This is what you had left. These people likely had homes. And so Hoovervilles, again, were people that were forced to live in whatever they could. These were communities of homeless that tried to help each other as best they could, but this is what people had left. They took whatever blankets and rope they could, and they would try to live under cloth. You also had Hoover flags. These were Hoover flags. And you would take your pockets and turn them out. You would wave them. Mr. President, look. I'm waving my flag at you. What does that suggest? <laughs> what did a Hoover flag suggest? They had no money left. Hey, President Hoover, you were right. Prosperity. Look at all the flags I was able to buy thanks to you. Everyone now has a flag in every pocket. Thanks for that, President Hoover. And you know what these were called? Hoover blankets. Hoover blankets. Because people couldn't afford blankets, so President Hoover, thanks for the newspaper. Everyone now has a blanket as well. You were right. A chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Just that instead of chicken, it's rocks. Instead of cars, uh, it's rocks. And instead of a garage, it's a, it's a rock. <laughs> so ultimately, what you have here is a society that's collapsing. And they're sarcastically referring to Hoover for all the failures. Um, it's not fair to say that Hoover single-handedly caused the Great Depression, 
but you can argue that he, he didn't do enough to make things better for the people that were suffering at the time. Um, and he didn't. Well, t well, he tried eventually, but it was a little bit too late. The photos that you see during the Great Depression, folks, um, majority of these photos were taken by a woman named Dorothea Lang. She's a Great Depression photographer. So you guys should note her name, Dorothea Lang. Uh, she was the, she's best known as the Great Depression photographer. So she'll take photos like these. This is not Dorothea Lang. This is one of the photos that she took. Um, but she took photos to kind of get a sense of the sorrow and depression and the emotions of the Great Depression during this time period. Again, Dorothea Lang. Great Depression photographer. I can hear people looking for work. Talk about the psychological impact of the Great Depression. You have to imagine that if you were a husband that lost all your money on the stock market, how would you feel about yourself once you realize that you lost your entire family's fortune? Yeah, you feel like you couldn't take care of your family, whatever else. Um, ultimately, many people, many men, but women also, lost their self-worth. Many people lost their own self-worth. They felt that they were useless, worthless. Many people lost their self-worth. Many families broke up. Divorce rates increased because was there a lot of tension? Of course, I mean, many families blamed their husbands. Many husbands couldn't deal with the stress or the shame. Families broke up. Marriage and birth rates declined. Why? Why might birth rates decline? Yeah, they can't afford to have a kid. No one has a job. No one's working. You want to bring a child into this world? Can't feed it? I mean, at least during what? The Gilded Age? If you had a kid, you could make your kid work. There's no work. Your kid's going to starve struggle even more so than the Gilded Age. So again, birth rates declined. So did marriage rates. Why did marriage rate decline? Why might less people be getting married at this time? Hmm? Where is the issue of money? It's not really an issue of money per se. I think it, ultimately what it comes down to is an issue of happiness. No, people just weren't happy. I mean, you're starving, you're hungry, you're looking for work, you're dirty. You know, you're not gonna be looking for Prince Charming, you're gonna be looking for a sandwich. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. You're not looking for love at the moment. You're hungry, you need a job, you want a roof over your head. And so while love marriages are wonderful and idealistic, that's not gonna happen during this time period. Now, I would surmise that you'd probably be better off married because at least you have two people working together. I mean, one of the biggest arguments is that Married couples succeed far more because you have two people working together. But I think that people just weren't happy. You know, like they're not thinking about marriage and the economic utility of being married. They're thinking about just how do I survive today? So you have that going on. Um, three million people ended up becoming hobos. You know, hobos were homeless people that traveled from city to city. You guys are familiar with the images of people you know getting on the train and traveling from city to city but three million three million people become hobos they travel from city to city what are they doing they're looking for work right they're looking for work so three million uh, people uh, become hobos looking for work you guys I've drew, I've drawn you the picture before about the guy with the stick and the, the thing city to city um, Malnutrition is also a problem. You know, people are not eating well. But I should probably make very clear right from the very beginning so you don't sound silly when you write your essays. Few people, very few people died of starvation. Very few actually died of starvation. There was still food to eat. There just wasn't a lot of it. Does that make sense? So did some people die of starvation? Sure but very few died of starvation. Likely the people that died of starvation were died as they were trying to travel across the desert or across the prairies. Does that make sense? They, were just, they just happened to be in the middle of nowhere when they ran out of food. 
But if you were in the city, were you going to die of starvation? No. Very, very unlikely. Now, it wasn't like the situation was ideal. You're not, you're not nourished, but at least you're not going to starve to death. Um, again, here's a, a family uh, again staking out in the middle of the road right now, mother taking care of her child, as she tries to figure out what they're going to do next. I mean, here's just where you hang out for a bit. I mean, that's not safe for a kid, but where else are you going to go? Um, the strange society, well, you don't have to write all of this down. Uh, there are just some other things. Um, one thing you guys should note is suicide rates rose over 30%. So think about that, folks. 30% of the population considered suicide or failed or successfully committed suicide. 30%. 30% of the population tried to commit suicide and many succeeded and others failed. That's a serious statistic. I mean, folks, the day of the stock market, people began jumping out of buildings because they lost everything. They committed suicide right then and there. Other families said, you know, instead of, you know, suffering from this, let's just kill ourselves. You know, entire families would commit suicide. So suicide was pretty high. People just lost self-worth. They argued, what's the point? Living conditions got worse. You don't have to worry about stresses on families. But you should be familiar with discrimination. As the society got worse and the economy got worse, discrimination against non-whites increased. African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans. Discrimination against non-whites increased. Why? Job competition. If there's a black man or an Asian man or a Latino man with a job, what's a white man going to believe? That's my job. I'm better. Why do you have that job? That is my job. You took that from me. And so likely, what are me and my friends going to do? We're going to get you out of the town or we're going to hang you. Because that's my job. So did racial discrimination increase during the Great Depression? Of course. Because like we talked about before, folks, if all resources were abundant and we had unlimited resources and jobs, would there be racial discrimination? Probably not, because would everyone have everything that they wanted? Of course. But because things are limited, is there going to be racism? Of course. If everyone was happy and everyone was not struggling, then I almost guarantee you there wouldn't be any racism. But it's because people are struggling that they have to put their pains on someone else. And so things are bad, folks. And again, all of that we just talked about will last for a good 15 years. Now, can you imagine living under that for 15 years? I mean, we're only, what, into year four? You're five now of our uh, recession, and things are already getting better. Imagine having to wait a good 10 years before things get better. And then even when we get better, it's not better. Things only get better by 1944. So we'll see how that goes. So here are the long-term causes of the Great Depression. Again, what was the short-term cause, like the immediate cause? Yeah, the stock market crash, right? The stock market crash is the immediate cause. The Great Crash or the stock market crash. But the long-term causes of the Great Depression are the following. The first is the unstable banking system, which resulted in overspeculation. Mismanagement is one thing, but overspeculation is the key thing. That one we're pretty good with. The second thing, folks, an unequal distribution of wealth. Pretty much families had limited income to purchase goods. Remember how we talked about workers' wages? Did wages increase during the Roaring Twenties? No, right? I mean, wasn't society producing a lot more? And weren't things getting better during the Roaring Twenties? So shouldn't have average families gotten paid more? Of course, but they didn't. And so during this time period, when we look at the data, 5% of the population controlled 30% of the nation's wealth. That's a lot when 5% control 30. These are your mega rich. And so that's not a really good distribution of wealth. I mean, I would surmise that, you know what? If 5% controlled 10%, I think I'd be okay with that. I feel like that's, that's not the best, but I understand there's gonna be super rich. But when 5% control 30%, that's a pretty terrible a statistic. And here's the problem, folks. If regular families like you and I, let's say I had a million dollars, and I had an option of dividing it between 
a thousand families or giving it to one person. Here's how that would play out. If I gave a thousand families, let's say a thousand dollars, what would each of you guys probably do with that thousand dollars? Invest, maybe buy stuff, right? You might buy cars, you might buy appliances. And as you, as a thousand families, take that million dollars and buy things, is that going to create jobs? Is that going to improve the stock market? Sure, you might buy a thousand cars or a thousand appliances. But if you give that million dollars to me, I might buy one really nice car, but that's it. And so how many jobs did I create? Zero jobs, maybe one job. And that one car that rolls off the lot, that job is temporary. That job only created one job for just one guy, and that's it. That car is really nice, and sure it cost a million dollars, but guess what? I only made one. Whereas if you all bought something, that's a thousand items that were purchased you know, by a thousand families. That's a lot. And so really they said we should have given families more money. Um, overproduction of goods. If you overproduce folks, what tends to happen? Prices fall. Right? When you produce too much of anything, prices fall because you have to get rid of products. So prices will fall naturally. Here's how we know that, by the way, economics, lesson 101. Here's supply, here's demand. Here's the ideal price and quantity and price. But if you produce too much, what am I doing? <laughs> I'll teach you this later. Huge farm surpluses have the same problem. With huge farm surpluses, what also is a problem? If you have too much farm goods, what happens? Prices will fall. War debt's not paid back. And if war debts are not paid back, then American banks will not get their money back. Also a problem. Then you have problems of buying on margin, the buying on credit. That's going to create speculation on stocks and also speculation on appliances and cars. So people are overstretching their uh, budgets. So we talked about how maybe the guy talking to the squirrel Maybe he didn't invest so much in the stock market, but was it possible that maybe he was over-speculating in cars or appliances? Maybe. He was encouraged to purchase during the Roaring Twenties. Weak industries, the farm, railroad, and food industries were weakened. Why might the farm and food industry be weakened at this time? What happened during the Roaring Twenties that hurt the farm and food industry? Well, the war made them better, and then what happened? Why did they decline all of a sudden in the late 1920s? Yeah, the recovery, right? The European recovery. And why might the railroad industry be weakened? Why did the railroad industry get weakened? Because of cars. Cars weakened them. So some of our most mainstay industries in America are weakening because of issues that are out of our control. I mean, that's what's going to happen. I mean, look at the post office, right? Post office is not a $16 billion hole. Every year they're losing $16 billion because they're losing uh, their business to who? Internet. Internet, email. You know, why am I gonna send you a letter in the mail that costs me 42 cents when email is free and immediate? You don't have to wait three days to get my response. And so internet is really taking away their business. And then advertising and entertainment. We promoted mass consumption. People started buying. People started buying on credit. Then all of a sudden, People didn't have any money left. So these are the long-term causes of the Great Depression, folks. It's a lot. Society was not balanced. Society was headed towards destruction no matter what. By the way, folks, you can look at all of these and wonder, I wonder if these are always true for every single depression. And usually the answer to some degree is just yes. Because look, 
Spe over speculation, over speculation, over speculation. Producing too much is over speculation, over speculation. I mean, always, folks, the term is what? Over speculation. Whether it's factories over speculating, producing so much because they can't lose, farmers over speculating because, you know, this will never end, banks over speculating because the stock market will never crash. Buying on credit by individual consumers because don't worry, times will always be good. Or, you know, advertisers and uh, entertainment saying keep on buying because America will always be great. Stock market crashes and economic panics are always caused by over speculation of some kind or another. Don't worry about writing this down. Here's just how things work out, though. Um, the bankers call brokers wanting their money. The brokers go to investors to collect their money to pay the bank loans borrowed by broker for investor. Orders to sell any price at any price swamp the market, but no one wants to buy. Brokers go under. Stocks are worthless. Investors lose their savings. I probably should spell it correctly. Uh, run on the banks. People begin to panic and go to banks. They try to withdraw their money, but the banks have no money to give back. Banks close. People lose their savings. Bank businesses close. Could not pay back uh, loans to banks. Workers lose their jobs. No money to buy consumer products. Sales fall, more businesses shut down, and more workers lose their jobs. So again, and as those, as those workers lose their jobs, will they have money? And will they be able to buy more things? So that means the stuff that they would buy, those businesses are going out, and then they fire people. And now those people have no money, so can they buy stuff? No, so that means the stuff that they would normally buy, they're no longer gonna buy, which means that business goes out of business, which means they have to fire their employees. See how that snowball effect just gets bigger and bigger and bigger? For every amount of things that you don't buy, all those workers are out of work, which means they can't buy anything, which means those customers are out of work, which means their workers are out of work, which means their workers are out of work. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Here's how it affects the global economy, guys. The great crash affected investors, which affected businesses and workers who were unemployed, which hurt banks, which hurt the global economy. Guys, the great crash ended the Dawes plan. And what ended the Dawes plan, what did that mean for Germany? Could Germany pay us back? I mean, could Germany uh, pay back its war loans? If Germany can't pay back England and France, England and France can't pay who back? Us. That becomes a serious problem. And by the way, that means not only can England and France not pay us back, Germany can't pay us back as well because they still have to pay us back. So again, it's one of those situations in which it's really going to hurt us in the long term. Um, our great crash does ultimately lead to a global depression. This will lead to a global depression. You wonder why Germany comes, uh, the, the Third Reich comes to power under Nazi Germany. It's because of the Great Depression. It causes a global panic, and Hitler says, let me take advantage of this. So how does Hoover respond, you ask? Let's talk about Hoover's response to the crash. Okay. One thing we should note is that when Herbert Hoover was president, he tried to single-handedly uh, fix the economy on his own, which is not a good idea. Uh, this problem was too much for one person to tackle, but he tried to fix the entire economy by himself. He had experts, but he didn't really use them. And so by fixing the economy on his own, uh, he's really going to encounter a lot of problems. So I would say that was one of his first mistakes is that he was like, oh, I'm president, I'll fix it. It really was not going to work out in his favor. One of the things that he tried to do was to create the Federal Farm Board. The Federal Farm Board. The Federal Farm Board uh, set up a $500 million fund. It set up a $500 million fund to buy farm surpluses. To buy farm surpluses. Why? What would that do? By buying farm surpluses, how is that going to help farm economies? 
prices would go up. Very good. So they're going to buy farm surpluses to drive up prices. Because if prices are up, might farmers be able to stay in business? That's the basic idea. Let's help farmers by buying up their surpluses, and that way farmers will be able to stay in business. Good so far? OK. That's one way that he's going to try to fix the economy. It's not the most ideal. It's not really fixing the problem. It's just saying, hey, keep producing what you're producing, and then uh, we'll just buy, and we'll just do this as if nothing ever happened. Trying to prevent farm foreclosures. Another thing that he did, which is considered to be a horrible, horrible idea, is passing the Holly Smoot Tariff in 1930. Guys, the Holly Smoot Tariff of 1930 was a very high tariff. Anyone want to take a guess as to how high it was? Don't be ridiculous, though. Any guesses as to high, how, how high this tariff was? 45%. Anyone else? 50%. It's a 60% tariff. A 60% tariff on all imported goods. That is a very high tariff. And naturally, folks, when we have tariffs, why are we doing them? Why did Hamilton do it? Why did Henry Clay do it? To protect what? Small businesses. In this case, he wants to protect failing American businesses. The whole purpose of tariffs, in this case, was to protect failing American businesses. <laughs> The problem is, if tariffs are so high on, let's say, European goods, is Europe going to like that? Because is Europe going to be able to sell their goods in America anymore? No, so they're pretty unhappy. Because does Europe need to recover too? Sure. So Europe is unhappy. They see this as an economic declaration of war. And so Europe begins a trade war or a tariff war with America. Actually, not even Europe. The world, other countries, begin a tariff war with America. So what you see is a global tariff war beginning. Fine, if you're going to put a 60% tariff on our goods, we're going to put a 60% tariff on your goods. And how is that going to hurt American producers? Why will that affect us as manufacturers and farmers? Yeah, it'll be difficult for us to sell our products in other countries. Imagine if they put a 200% tariff on American corn in Colombia. Is American goods going to be expensive there? Yeah, it's going to be three times what it's worth. And so that becomes a serious problem. So what it comes down to is that the Holly Smoot tariff was a horrible idea. Now, did he mean well? Sure. Was it good economic sense? No. And did he know that? No, he did not. Oh, wait. Yes, he did, because 1,000 economists from over 179 colleges told him this is a horrible idea. And he said, you know, I know you guys are experts. I get that. But I, I don't know. My gut tells me this will be a good idea. I don't know. I, I'm going to try it. Because I think, uh, based on nothing, I think this will work. I, I, I get what you're saying. This is a bad idea. I don't know. I just, I just feel like this is, this is going to be good for America, I think. So I'm going to do it. Ah, I just stop complaining. I'm president. So he passes it. And you tell me what happens. So I'm going to look at, we're going to look at the data and tell me if he was right. Because he thinks he is. He's going to go ahead and say the 1,079, uh, 1,028 economists are wrong. Uh, you know what? Because he knows best. What happened to world trade? Look what happened to global trade. Global trade declined dramatically because the tariff wars began. Could we sell really to other countries anymore? We could ship things over, but would we even bother? Let's say we sell corn and potatoes over to Ireland, but no one buys them because the tariff is too high. Should we keep selling, sending our corn over there or our potatoes? No, they're just going to rot. So what's the point? And so, folks, global trade almost comes to a standstill. It just pretty much stops. And do we need to help each other to kind of recover from, a, recover from this Great Depression? Sure. But instead, what we do is we stop buying from each other, and that's going to hurt us even further. Some other suggestions for economic recovery. Those like, here's how I think we're going to help. Uh, I know the farming thing was not the greatest, but how about this? Here's how we're going to help. Um, 
volunteerism. Yeah. Congress passed it because Congress is controlled by Republicans, and the economists wanted him to veto it. He said, no, no. I think that me and my friends are right. Well, him and the Congress came up with it, who were full of Republicans at the time. And remember, if you remember his election, landslide victory? Remember, when he was elected, so were other Republicans in Congress. And so when the Republicans and Hoover said, no, I think we're going to do this despite what economists might say, uh, the economists were like, we don't understand what you're doing. He said to Hoover, you're the last person. You have to veto this. He's like, no, no. I think, I think I'm going to pass it anyway. Volunteerism. Pretty much he said he wanted voluntary cooperation to fix the depression. Uh, so what he asked is that businesses avoid layoffs. Hey, if you're still in business and haven't shut down already, can you avoid layoffs? It'd be really great if you did not fire your employees. If you can, try to avoid layoffs. Secondly, uh, if you're a union member, can you avoid strikes? I mean, that would be so great for our economy right now if you guys just did not strike. Okay, so don't lay off workers, don't strike. But also, um, really, if, if you really could, I think what's really gonna help is uh, if the haves can help the have-nots. You guys know what I mean by that? The haves should help the have-nots by donating to what? Charity. Now, if you guys could just work in soup kitchens and give money to the Red Cross, I think that would just really help society out. You know, just give a potato or two, maybe a few hours, uh, if you have the time, to help our people out, because that would just really help the economic recovery. Um, is that at all going to meet the country's needs? Private charity. No. Very few people really benefited greatly. I mean, sure, you guys can go to the uh, soup kitchen, donate a few hours or two, but is that going to give these people jobs? You know, giving a potato or two, is that going to feed this family for a week? No. And so what it came down to was it was great that people were helping, but these policies were not going to help the economy recover. It was not going to get these people off the street. It was not going to close down these Hoovervilles. And so the policies still weren't working. He did try other things, public works. Um, he contributed over $750 million. He asked Congress to uh, contribute $750 million. He asked Congress to give $750 million to public works. He wanted to use $750 million for public works. Again, folks, whenever I say Hoover did, Hoover did, Hoover did, it's usually implied that he got Congress to do this. Does that make sense? Because obviously, like Marisol suggested, the president does not have unilateral power. However, in times when the president is fairly powerful, he can just say, Congress, do this for me. Congress will do it, and the president will then just enact it. In any case, he asked for $750 million that Congress approved for public works. The goal was to do what? Why do we want to build bridges, dams, canals, highways, buildings? Why do we want to build public works? Again, like bridges, canals, buildings, highways. Yeah, ultimately we're going to create jobs. The whole point is to create jobs. One of the things that were created was Hoover Dam in 1930, completed in 1936. Still there today. And ultimately, folks, Hoover Dam was created to make jobs. Also created to you know, create electricity and obviously just recently released uh, in the last few years, Hoover Dam was also created to hide Megatron. If you guys are familiar at all. Uh, back then, Arctic Explorer, uh, I forget the first name, but uh, Arctic Explorer Witwicky found uh, alien life form uh, Megatron uh, in the North Pole region, in the Arctic regions. And in order to prevent him, uh, this Megatron of sorts to communicate, uh, they hid him in... Uh, Hoover Dam because of the electric source, so you can be identified. Um, and so that's kind of what happens. As if you're curious at all about this, there's a document that came out a few years ago. Uh, it's called Transformers, uh, which kind of 
discusses uh, this this story of the Megatron, and uh, apparently there's an ongoing battle between them and um, it's, a, it's an alien race, I believe, that's known as the uh, the Decepticons and uh, the the Autobots. It's an ongoing war, and so that happens. So there's that. If any of you at all are also curious about, you know, why we haven't seen these life forms. I mean, they are around for the most part. Um, historians and social comment, uh, commentaries uh, suggest that uh, the robots are around. They're just in disguise. They're just uh, they're around. Obviously, none of that is true. Uh, but I, I pride myself in being able to tell lies with a straight face. So if you can't figure out then Megatron is not real, then you should watch Transformers and you'll find out otherwise. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation was another thing that uh, Hoover got Congress to pass. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, was given $2 billion. And the Reconstruction Finance Corporation given $2 billion, also known as the RFC. Uh, this will be the beginning of many acronyms that you guys have to know during this unit. RFC, AAA, WPA, PWA, SSS, SEC, NYLA, uh, HOLC. Uh, we call it alphabet soup during this time period. There's a lot you guys have to know in terms of acronyms. In any case, the RFC becomes uh, an organization created by Congress given $2 billion. $2 billion. Uh, their job is to provide loans to banks, businesses, and states. Their job is to provide money or loans to banks, businesses, and states for recovery. Banks, businesses, and states. Two billion dollars in loans to banks, businesses, and states for recovery. So if a business is failing, they'll give them some money. If a bank is failing, they'll give them some money. If a state is failing, they'll give them some money. But the RFC was given $2 billion by Congress to give loans to banks, businesses, and states for recovery. I mean, many of the states use this money for public works to create jobs. Businesses use it to fix their budgets, you know, create jobs as well. But ultimately, many people criticize the RFC for giving money to the rich and not to the poor. And they said this is what? What do you call this, folks? They said it was trickle down. They accused it of being trickle down. They said, so you're telling me you're going to help the businesses and the rich get better while I'm still living in a Hooverville? You know what would be better? It's if you gave money to us so we can buy houses and we can buy food. And we think that if you gave us the money, we would be able to create jobs because there would need to be people to make the house. There would be need people to make the food. You should give us the money. But they criticize the RFC for focusing on economic recovery and not relief. Relief, folks, means helping the people directly. Recovery is helping the economy. They criticize the RFC for focusing on recovery and not relief. Because do they have a point there? I mean, sure, you can create jobs, but I'm hungry right now. I don't see why you're not creating jobs by giving pe money to the people. Because let's be honest, folks, if I gave you money, could you guys create jobs also? You guys can create jobs by buying stuff. Does that make sense? By creating demand for what's called demand side economics, if you give money to the people, that'll create jobs. Um, that's pretty much what Barack Obama was suggesting, President Obama was suggesting in the State of the Union last night. He said he wants to increase the minimum wage by 20%, which is a lot. A 20% increase in minimum wage, so many of you might like that. But by doing so, does that mean that your, your families might have more money? And by having more money, could you buy more things? And by buying more things, would that increase the economy? That's the argument. So that's called demand side economics. The other side is supply side economics that you guys sometimes know as trickle down. They both work. It's just they should work together, not one or the other. But do you guys understand the criticism? It's focusing on recovery, not necessarily relief. 
they should do both, but he's only doing focusing on recovery. Here they are using that money and creating stuff. Here they are pumping all that money for public works and creating employment, supposedly. He also passed the Norris LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act. He thought this would help labor unions, and he thought that this would help business, um, because then workers would not go on strike anymore. The Anti-Injunction Act banned the use of what? Don't be clever now. <laughs> what did they ban the use of? Injunctions against labor unions, which means what can we no longer do? Don't say use injunctions. What is the definition? What can we no longer do? Declare strikes to be not unconstitutional, illegal. We can't declare strikes to be illegal anymore. Was the injunction a powerful tool used against strikes before? Yeah. Yes, now we're getting rid of it. That's a pretty big win for labor. And the goal was to encourage labor unions not to strike. The other thing is that it also banned yellow dog contracts. Another win for labor unions. So Norris LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act banned yellow dog contracts and injunctions. Cool beans. Cool beans. He also believed in rugged individualism. He used a quote all the time that society should pull themselves up by the bootstraps, or you should pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Uh, rugged individualism meant that he would not provide direct relief to the people. So no direct relief is what he meant by rugged individualism. If you were struggling, who should help you? Yourself. Because again, if I help you, you'll never learn. And he genuinely means that. It's this idea that, you know what, sometimes people have to struggle to get better. If I help you, then I'm always going to help you, and you'll never learn to be independent. So Americans have struggled. Americans know what it's like. When we first came to America, didn't we struggle on the frontier on our own? He said, just do the same thing. Let's keep doing that in this modern age. We have to promote this idea of rugged individualism because it's in our blood. We're born with it. We're, we're Americans. You know, we have to have it. And so he promotes this idea of rugged individualism, that the government will not help you. You have to pull yourselves up by the bootstraps. You have to pull yourselves up by your shoelaces. Now, can you do that? Can you actually pull yourself up by the shoelaces? Not really. That's physically impossible. But still, the idea is there. So people say, that's crazy. How can I help myself when I'm already living in a Hooverville? How much further am I allowed to pull myself up? I was create a job for myself? So people thought that this was unrealistic. You know? And the dangerous idea was that the idea that was still being promoted was, look, with just hard work, honesty, and a little bit of luck, you can be successful. But weren't many of these people hardworking? Weren't many of these people honest? So I guess what was missing is that 40% of the population was unlucky. I guess that's what it comes down to. But I don't think that's a fair assessment, is it? I think that when you say that all you need to be successful is hard work, luck, and honesty, I think that's forgetting the fact that there are racial barriers, institutional barriers, gender barriers, maybe an economic depression caused by government regulation or lack of. I think that we need to be a little bit more realistic back then and even today, guys. I think that when we still promote the idea that everyone can be successful if they just try hard, is it possible that you can work really, really hard and not be successful because of certain barriers? Of course. Last thing we have to learn about today, guys, is the bonus army and what Hoover did. By the time the bonus army came to Washington, guys, it was 1932. And here's what happened. In 1932, 14,000 unemployed World War I veterans marched on Washington. In 1932, already about three years into the Great Depression, 14,000 unemployed World War I veterans marched on Washington.
14,000 World War I veterans that were unemployed marched on Washington. This happens a lot, armies going to Washington marching, doesn't it? Happens a lot. What was the last army that marched on Washington? You guys remember? Also unemployed? They stepped on the grass? Yeah, you remember what that army was? Jacob Coxey's army. Coxey's army. In any case, they march on Washington. And what they want is they demand that the bonus that was promised to them by 1945 be paid today. They demanded that the bonus that was promised to them by 1945 should be paid today. That the bonus promised to them by 1945 should be paid today. What happened, folks, was that uh, Congress said, hey, thanks for fighting in the war. We want to thank you for your efforts during World War I. So uh, we promise to pay you a special bonus in 1945, when the economy recovers and things are better. Well, they said that it's great that you're going to pay us in 1945, but there's a, there's a small problem there. We want that money now. And why might they want the money now? They need it now. They're unemployed. They say, look, I'm starving. 45, that's another 13 years. I might not be alive by then. I might have starved to death. I'm hungry now. I need the money now. My kids need the money now. And so we need that money today. Why are we going to wait until 1945? We fought already. We did our part. When are you going to hold up your bargain? And so they demanded that Congress pay the bonus today. Congress, naturally, said no. But again, they said no because they couldn't pay the bonus. Guys, it's 1932. It's been three years since the Great Depression already began. Are a lot of people unemployed? Which means if people are not working, what else can't they do for the government? Why doesn't the government have money? People aren't what? They can't pay taxes. They have no jobs. And so does the government have any money? No. The government has no money. And so the government has no money. So that's a problem. And so they say, sorry, we'll pay for you guys to go home. So they did pay for some people to go home. But many refused to leave. And so many stayed in the bonus camps, continuing to protest. They refused to leave. Well, eventually, as they continued to protest, President Hoover, not happy with how this looked, decided to send in the US Army to remove the bonus army. Hoover sends in the US Army to remove the bonus army. In the clash between the US Army and these World War I veterans, two veterans are killed. They use tear gas against them, they fire live bullets against some of them, and they set the bonus camps on fire. Yes, two US or bonus army soldiers are killed. They use tear gas, they even set the bonus camps on fire. As you can see, there were some kids in that camp. Uh, hard times are still hoovering over us, is what that kid wrote. Pretty intelligent for a one-year-old. But again, you know, during the Great Depression, you have to grow up quickly. I mean, how is he going to make a living if he can't read and write? So this one-year-old wrote that sign himself. He's got to make a living, guys. Times are hard. Again, the argument was, look, if we did this and now we're in this, don't we deserve to have our bonus paid? I mean, why don't we get our bonus now? Well, folks, Hoover dealt with that uh, bonus army situation very poorly. And so uh, the significance of it is that Hoover appeared heartless. Hoover appeared to be heartless. And as a result, it will help him lose the upcoming election. Also, there's this thing about the Great Depression that I think will help him lose as well. But because he's heartless, and he seems like he's a horrible person, 
because he killed World War I veterans, uh, his heartlessness will help him lose the upcoming election in 1932. Questions there? No? Okay. Ultimately, Hoover was defeated by Mickey Mouse and a Keyblade because he's heartless. Anyone? Anyone? Keyblade? Heartless? No one? Rats. No one here has played Kingdom Hearts, the video game? Oh my. Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks, that's it for today. Let me give you your chapter homework assignments, and then that'll be it. Uh, otherwise, let me turn this off. That's it.